Well, friends, good morning. It's a beautiful crisp morning in Bathurst this morning, and I'm so glad that you've joined us, um, especially if you're a visitor. That is, if you're not normally meeting with us in our churches, we're so glad that you've joined us via this means today. This is actually week eight of church via video, and we're thankful for the technology that allows us to connect together in this way. But more than you and me connecting, today, of course, we connect with our Lord Jesus Christ. Our praise and thanks are directed towards him for his grace and mercy shown in his death and resurrection, and that we have forgiveness and we've been reconciled to God through Jesus. So that is our joy and delight today. Our prayers and readings come all the way from Narromine today. And we have a guest preacher today, the Reverend Dr. John Dixon, will lead us in the final of our Corona Crisis series. And I'm so glad that he's um, been willing and able to join us um, by this means today. Uh, this beautiful song from Hillsong uh, reminds us of the beginning of the gospel right through to that end when we will see Jesus face to face.
Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of Kings. From Revelation 15 we read, Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Our Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify your name this morning. We thank you for your love, your majesty, your might, your holiness. We praise you for your presence with us now by your indwelling Holy Spirit. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that in these minutes we might draw close to you, that we might hear you speak to us, that we might authentically speak to you, and that you would take us from the, these minutes that we spend together refreshed and equipped in your service. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the significant things that we do when we come together is confess our failings before God. Uh, we ought to do so. We're encouraged to do so. And Christianity encourages us to be completely open and honest before our God. And so let's just take a moment uh, to reflect on this week past, uh, to acknowledge before God our own personal failings and then our corporate failings together. Uh, the prayer that we're going to use this morning will not be familiar to you, but I hope it might be fresh to you and enable you to uh, participate in this time of uh, confession together. Gracious God, thank you for the glorious, liberating news of the forgiveness of sins. We repent this morning of the failures and rebellion of this week. We praise you that through Jesus, we are forgiven and have eternal life. To you, Lord, be all glory and power forever and ever. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. As we prepare to hear from the Word of God this morning, this beautiful hymn, uh, Show Us Christ. It begins, Prepare our hearts, O God. Help us to receive. Break the hard and stony ground. Help our unbelief. Plant your Word down deep in us. Cause it to bear fruit. Open up our ears to hear. Lead us in your truth. May this be your prayer as we come to hear God's Word this morning. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, help us to receive, break the hard and stony ground, help our unbelief, plant your
1 Peter 3, 13 to 18. This is God's word. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. This is God's word for the word of the Lord. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a guest preacher today, the Reverend Dr. John Dixon. John and I have been friends and colleagues for many years. We worked together at St. Andrews Roseville. He subsequently took over from me as rector of St. Andrews Roseville. Uh, and today he spends his time uh, writing and speaking across the world. He's a prolific author. And I'm sure you've probably heard of John before. Uh, John is going to lead us in the last of our Corona Crisis series, Having a Ready Answer. So I hope that you'll have that passage uh, that was read for us open in front of you from 1 Peter 3. And John, thank you so much for being with us. Well, hi, um, it's a great pleasure to be with you, actually. When uh, Mark invited me to speak uh, to the Bathurst Diocese, I was reminded that uh, when I used to sing in a band called In the Silence, we toured all around, uh, well, all of uh, country Australia. But I especially remember uh, our Bathurst tour. And Mark sent me a list of all the towns in his diocese, about 15 or 20 towns. And I reckon I've been to half of them doing shows. So the thought that I'm now uh, preaching is uh, just a real delight to me. I want to talk about being open about our faith uh, during these really difficult times. Uh, I was uh, years ago in a cafe with a pastor friend talking about what we were doing at my church to reach out to the people of our suburb. And I noticed this woman sitting a few tables away in the cafe looking sort of inquisitive at me. Well, that's how I interpreted it. So I kept on talking to my uh, friend 
about what we were doing to reach out to others uh, with the news of Jesus Christ. And then eventually this woman came over. She paid her bill and walked over to our table. And at what seemed like the top of her voice, in front of a packed cafe, she said, you want to convert the world, do you? How dare you? And off she stormed. <laughs> I was dumbfounded. I mean, obviously this was the moment I realized she might not have been a Christian after all, uh, but I didn't know what to say. Um, I was just struck dumb. And, you know, it was a really powerful reminder to me that even though I was meant to be a professional God botherer, I didn't know what to say in that context. The cynicism she had toward Christianity uh, just left me silent. And I'll tell you that because I just want to make clear that this subject of speaking up about our faith is not an easy one, even for the professionals. I reckon if uh, you've known Christ for more than about five minutes, you will have experienced a kind of shyness every now and then, a shyness about piping up. And perhaps especially now during this lockdown, um, because we could get some really awkward questions at the moment about the Christian faith. You might find that people are asking, what's God doing? Uh, where is he in the midst of this? Is this pandemic the judgment of God? And so on. And so I want to draw some encouragement from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, where the apostle Peter uh, encourages Christians who were under pressure to be open about their Christian faith. And if this were a different kind of talk, I'd love to tell you a little bit of the history that we know of the region to which uh, Peter wrote. Uh, we call it Turkey now, but it was Pontus and Bithynia and Asia. And we know that um, within a generation of this letter of Peter, the Christians there suffered immense persecution. Um, Peter simply refers to a fiery ordeal later in chapter four. Um, but if we had time, I'd read to you from uh, a letter uh, from the Roman governor Pliny to the Emperor Trajan. Uh, he was the governor of this very region, and he speaks about killing Christians. He says that uh, I ask them in person if they are Christians. If they admit it, I repeat it with a warning a second or third time. If they persist, I order them to be led away for execution. And it goes on and on. I won't bother with that. But 1 Peter was written in the prelude to an awful persecution. And the Christians there wanted to be quiet, I bet. I bet the emotional pressure was to be shy about the Christian faith. And instead, the apostle urges them to speak up. And so that's what this uh, wonderful passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, from verses 13 to 16, is all about. And he provides a number of uh, lessons that I think uh, are worth our attention uh, just for a few minutes today. The first thing Peter urges is to revere Christ. Before he gets to say anything about speaking up for the faith, always giving an answer, uh, what he actually says there in verse, um, well, let's go from verse 14. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not be frightened, do not fear their threats, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always being prepared to give an answer. The first thing he says is revere Christ as Lord in our hearts. The logic, I think, is that there were many things to fear in the world of those first Christians, but they need to remember to revere Christ above all all things. Actually, um, the original language of this sentence is quite powerful because it says, revere Christ as Lord, always being prepared to give an answer. They're not two separate questions. They're linked. Our reverence for Christ, our worship of Christ is directly connected with our willingness to speak up for him. You know, there are all sorts of reasons Christians can be shy about the Christian faith. Maybe there are intellectual questions where we're worried about, we don't know the answers to. Perhaps we're just shy human beings. Perhaps we ourselves have doubts and uh, really don't want to be exposed. Whatever the reasons for Christian coyness, 
The antidote is right here in this text. Revere Christ as Lord in our hearts. Don't think in terms of, oh, I have to evangelize my neighbors. First think of who Christ is. Know that he is to be revered above all things. And then watch your speaking about Christ just bubble up uh, as, a, as a natural consequence. So firstly, revere Christ. And it's out of this reverence for Christ that uh, Peter issues the encouragement to reply, to give a reply. He says, always be prepared. So uh, verse 15, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Notice Peter uh, doesn't tell us all to preach. We're not told we're all evangelists. No, Peter simply says, be prepared to give an answer. And that's something we can all do. And he's quite adamant about it. He says, always be prepared to give an answer and to everyone. So uh, although we're not all told to be preachers, we are answerers. We are to give an answer for our faith. And I suppose at the moment, there are some tricky questions people might want to ask us uh, in the context of this pandemic. And they may want to say, what's God doing? Uh, why does he allow it? Is this judgment? Where is God in the midst of all the suffering we see around the world? Uh, just a few things uh, that I think might be worth uh, talking about. I think the easiest way to reply to anyone who asks you about this uh, is really just to say, look, frankly, I don't know what God's doing, but I do know he wants me and the church to care for people uh, who are vulnerable. And so I can do that. And that's where I'm going to be focusing my attention. Now, that may seem like a cop out, but actually, I think pe most people who ask you about all this uh, will be satisfied to go, oh, yeah, OK, that makes sense. But if you do get an opportunity to go a little bit uh, deeper, I think there are a few things that you might want to uh, mention. One is that this isn't the judgment of God. Um, people have been talking like it's the judgment of God. Uh, I won't name names, but <laughs> some Christian leaders have come out and said, oh, it's the judgment of God for you know particular sins. But actually, Jesus spoke to this question uh, in Luke 13, where uh, he is quizzed by people who thought a natural disaster that occurred, a tower falling on people, uh, occurred because they were worse sinners. And Jesus um, absolutely rules that out. He says, no, that is not what is happening here. He doesn't then explain what it was, but he rules out that it is uh, judgment. Um, you know, yes, the text goes on to say to those people, hey, but beware um, that you don't fall into the actual judgment of God. But he's not connecting that final judgment with the event of the natural disaster. So I think we can rule that out. Uh, the closest thing the Bible gives to an explanation of these kinds of um, natural sufferings is that creation has gone astray as a kind of reverberation of humanity going astray from the Creator. So something has fallen, not just in our own hearts, but in the very creation itself. That's about as close to an explanation as the Bible uh, gives. And I think the last thing maybe that's uh, worth saying, uh, probably the most important thing to say to people who ask us about this, is to do with where God is in the midst of a pandemic. Where is he in all the suffering? And I think the most important thing to say is that the God Christians believe in is the God who gave himself on a cross for us. He has entered into human suffering. He is not aloof. He is not distant, but he is present. He's not the God who just wound up the clock and left us to suffer. He entered into our suffering. So whatever is the ultimate explanation for the suffering of this world, we know it must be consistent with a God who would himself share our pain, himself enter into our world and identify with our suffering. Well, you may or may not be comfortable saying any of those uh, particular things, uh, but there is one aspect of speaking up Peter urges us all to do, respect those we talk with. He makes this quite clear when he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. 
keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Peter asks us to respect the human beings who have asked us questions and to be gentle toward them. These are two really important words. I mean, it's true that not every criticism of the Christian faith deserves respect, but the people criticizing the faith or asking us about the faith are made in the image of God and so are worthy of respect. And sometimes it's hard to be gentle when people critique Christianity, um, but uh, the love of Christ should compel us to a humility, to a gentleness that refuses to be smug or self-righteous or to bully anyone, but simply to offer our answer with respect and gentleness. We might not know what to say in every situation, but we all know how to say it with gentleness and respect. And you know, you never uh, can really predict what a simple answer to someone's question may bring about. My own Christian story as a 16 year old, uh, having never been inside a church, I asked a teacher at my school a question. This teacher was openly Christian. And I asked her, uh, what does God think of me? And uh, I was a little bit of a skeptical uh, teenager, but I was curious to know what this person thought. And this woman just said to me these few words, uh, John, God sees everything you've done, said, and thought. And then she left a pause. And I remember feeling pretty awkward thinking, oh no, God sees everything I've done, said, and thought. And then she followed it up with, but he loves you even still. I thanked her for the comment. I shot out into the playground, but I couldn't get rid of those words. They went round and round in my head. Uh, God knows everything I've done, said, and thought, but he loves me even still. And I would say, humanly speaking, this was the thing that first prompted me to want to know this God who knew me and despite me, loved me. You never know how a simple answer to someone's question might promote Christ in a beautiful way. Peter, in this passage, asks us to revere Christ. Before we think about mission, let's think about worship. Let's know who he is, revere him, and we won't fear anything else. Peter asks us then, out of that reverence for Christ, to give a reply to everyone who asks us to just be willing to step up and say something for Jesus. But then he reminds us to do it with respect and gentleness, because that's what the gospel calls from us. Because we believe in a God who entered into the world, gave himself for us in such humility and rose again to give life. And so our speech to others must be of that kind, humble, life-giving. God bless you. Dear God, thank you that despite all the pain and loss that the virus has created, we, found, we find our hope in you. Please help us to take the opportunity that the pandemic has created to communicate our hope to those feeling hopeless. Please help us to do so with gentleness and respect and to know how to respond to the difficult questions that we are asked during this time. We are sorry for when we have not taken the opportunities you have given us to spread your word to those who need to hear it. Thank you that we get to be involved in sharing your good news. Lord God, in these difficult times, please fill us with calm, peace and hope. We pray that reacting in this way to current events would cause those around us to want to know the peace that you bring. Despite how we may be affected, please help us to continue serving those around us with generosity and love. Thank you that your defeat of death on the cross means that we do not even need to fear death itself. Please help us to emulate your Son by reassuring others that death has been defeated and replaced with eternal life with you. We pray that our actions and decisions would reflect to our community your ability to bring about hope to a hopeless world. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the progress that we have been making in reducing the spread of coronavirus. Thank you that we are at a point where lockdowns are gradually easing and we can begin to return to normalcy. Thank you for the hard work of our leaders and health professionals. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, jobs and their way of life. Please help them to look to you as their comfort and refuge in these difficult times. Please help our health professionals to develop a vaccine soon so that the pain we are going through may come to an end. Lord, we pray for our churches and dioceses during this time. Thank you that we have already found new ways to get together in fellowship. 
and we pray that more and more of us would come together online while we aren't able to meet physically. Please help us to use this opportunity to grow your church by inviting non-Christians to join church services and Bible studies over Zoom. Please also help us to be creative in assisting those most vulnerable to the virus. We pray that our role in serving the community would not be diminished while we are isolated, and that we would individually show love and care to those around us as followers of Jesus. In Jesus' name, Amen. We conclude our time of prayer by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm so glad you've been able to be with us today. This brings to an end the Corona Crisis series. But the next three Sundays are very significant in the church calendar for we're going to celebrate the ascension that Jesus ascended on high and intercedes for us, that he sent his Holy Spirit, the festival of Pentecost, and then that we know God, God has been revealed to us as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, God in Trinity. So please do keep joining us over these next three weeks as we mark these significant celebrations together. Our final song, Only a Holy God. Spirit.
I'm going to close in prayer. Grant, Father, that we might always revere you as Lord. Grant that we might have a reply ready for anyone who asks us for the reason for the hope that we have. And grant, Father, that we might do so with respect. And may the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in you what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen.